Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about tonight is the Gospel from the 8th chapter of Mark. Dear friends in Christ, expectations. Don't we all have expectations? And people have expectations of all kinds of things. First of all, couples have expectations of what marriage is going to be like. Hopefully the expectations that couples have keep them in the real world, but certainly sometimes some of them are a bit far-fetched. Parents have expectations of how their children are going to turn out, and for most of us parents, we hope and expect that our children are going to be decent, they're going to be loving, they're going to be caring, and we pray that they'll get a decent job and have a, an excellent mate and make a healthy contribution to society. Sports fans have expectations of their teams. Sadly, sometimes they're more fantasy than they are reality. Of course, we know that this is yet another presidential election year and in any election, voters have expectations of the politicians involved, and they have expectations of political movements as well. And certainly, we're going to see all kinds of things happening in this year, and I pray that the expectation that we all have is that in the end, God grants us good, solid leaders in our country, in our state, and in our local areas too. People have expectations of Christians as well. Sometimes those expectations are a tad unrealistic, like we saw people dealing with Tim Tebow during the football season and on into the first part of this year. Uh, some people is thinking the guy would walk on water and that Tebow mania, you know, he could solve not only any problem on the football field, but he can solve any problem in the world, too. Some expectations that people have of Christians also are bad, like uh, the stereotypical hypocrisy of the so-called church lady that we were so familiar with in uh, Saturday Night Live a number of years ago. And thankfully, some expectations of us Christians are good. Like, hey, Christians are people who pray for each other and care for each other in times of need. Now, as we think of these expectations, we can see some of them and laugh at them. We can nod our heads in agreement that some of these things exist, and we can even be sad and have some disappointment that some of the lesser expectations that people have are sadly true. But while it's okay for us to be off in our expectations in some areas of life, there are other areas where it is extremely important for us to have expectations that are fully grounded in reality and in truth. And, of course, we see the importance of that in today's Gospel in the 8th chapter of Mark. Last weekend, uh, last Sunday, was the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And every year in the first Sunday of Lent, the Gospel reading is taken from the first chapter of Mark or uh, chapter 4 of Matthew or Luke. And that talks about a very specific topic and that is the temptation that Jesus experienced at the hands of Satan in the wilderness, which happened right at the very beginning of his public ministry. And we saw in that gospel how Jesus was intensely focused right from the very start. He was focused on carrying out the will of his Father in every single thing that he did, in everything that he said, Jesus would not allow himself to be deflected even for a moment from what his purpose was in life. And in the gospel today in Mark 8, Jesus picks up on that very same thing again. 
But it's interesting that he applies that theme not only to himself, but as we'll see, he pushes it even further and applies that theme to all of his people, even to us. He calls on us to see through the deception of short-term gain and false expectations that might cause us to lose sight of the true purpose of Jesus' life and ministry among us. And also, we can lose the long-term benefit of being children of God for all eternity. Now, the setting for today's gospel finds us at that time in Jesus' ministry, when he had already been out there ministering for some time, and he had gained a lot of fame because of his teaching, but especially Jesus gained a ton of fame because of all the incredible miracles that he had been performing. And everywhere Jesus went, more and more people were following him. And when they came to him, they were expecting huge things from Jesus. And why not? I'd ask you when you go home tonight, just pick up a Bible at home and glance through the paragraph headings from Mark chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And in just like a one-minute perusal of those paragraph headings, you'll see that in rapid-fire succession, one after another, Jesus had been performing spectacular miracles of building on each other. He healed the sick. He healed the disease. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. And not only that, he fed literally thousands and thousands of people with virtually no food at all. And then to cap it off, the greatest of his miracles while he was carrying out his ministry, Jesus even raised the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. He had raised her from the dead when she had been dead for some time. So it got to the point that Jesus and the disciples were being swamped with people wherever they went. And they had to escape to get a breather and also to give Jesus a chance to speak to his closest friends and to teach them what he was really all about. So Jesus did this by taking the 12 disciples on a road trip, literally out of the country. They went north. They crossed the border of Israel into what is now the modern-day country of Syria. That's so much in the news. And Jesus took them in Syria to a place called Caesarea Philippi so that he could talk privately to the disciples, his 12 closest friends. Now, as always happened, even though he wanted to get away privately, still huge crowds of people followed them all the way to Caesarea Philippi. They did keep their distance at first, so Jesus and the disciples had a little bit of privacy. And once Jesus had them settled down, he wanted to teach them what his real purpose was, and he began by asking them a question. He said to them, basically, you guys have been out there in the middle of the crowds when I've been speaking and when I've been performing all of these miracles. So as you have been out in these crowds, who is it that the people are saying that I am? And the disciples expressed the opinions of the people. They said, yeah, some people, Lord, are saying that you're John the Baptist come back to life again. Because by this point in the gospel, John had already been killed. He had been beheaded by King Herod. Some of the other disciples said, yeah, there are other people who are saying that your Elijah returned from the world after being gone for 700 years. And then other of the disciples said, there's more people that are saying, well, Jesus, you're one of the ancient prophets. Come back to life again. That wasn't the real question that Jesus was interested in for the disciples. He didn't care about those answers because they were all wrong. But what Jesus was really getting at 
was teaching them who he actually was, is, and always will be. So he got to that point by asking them another question. He said, okay, you've heard what everybody else is saying about me. Now I want to ask you, who do you say that I am? When the disciples were asked a question, an easy question, like who are other people saying that I am, they would all speak up and have an answer. But when you read through the Gospels, you'll notice that when Jesus actually challenged the disciples, more often than not, most of them hung back and wouldn't say a word to him. But there was one guy you could always count on to jump up and to speak no matter what the situation was, and that was the namesake of this church. That was Peter. So when Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter did jump up right away, and he blurted out, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, of course, was 100% right. And Jesus told him so. But it was that answer that then was the very beginning of Jesus' teaching, his true teaching, that he wanted to get across to the disciples and really to all of us. Because after Peter said, you, Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus then proceeded to tell them what he was going to do as the Son of God, what was going to happen to him as the Son of God, and what was the purpose of all of it. What Jesus spoke was not false expectations or erroneous things, but Jesus spoke reality. And that reality was absolutely not at all what Peter and the other 11 disciples or anybody else in Israel thought he was going to do. When Jesus talked about fulfilling the expectations that God the Father had for him, the people were shocked and they couldn't believe it because what did Jesus say in the gospel? He told them, as the son of the living God, I am going to be arrested at the hands of my enemies. I am going to suffer at the hands of my enemies and I am going to die at the hands of my enemies. They heard all of that. They didn't hear the last part of what he said. And then on the third day, I will rise from the dead. The disciples only heard arrest, suffer, die. And once again, Peter just jumps up and blurts out. And what he said was, no way! Jesus, this is not going to happen to you. And the way it's written in the gospel, it says that Peter rebuked Jesus. What a gutsy move on his part. Peter, a human being, rebuking the guy he said, you are the son of the living God. He was kind of acting like a father, rebuking his son for saying something totally false. Hopefully none of us would ever do that. I can't imagine of any of us if we were standing before Jesus telling him, you got it all wrong, Jesus, let me tell you how it's going to be. Jesus was not going to stand for that. So Jesus flipped it around on Peter and instantly rebuked him. And he said something to Peter that was extremely, extremely strong. He told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. This little picture is where expectations come in, particularly false expectations, because Peter took that initiative that the others didn't and said that Jesus suffering and dying isn't a part of the package for the savior of the universe at all. Instead, Peter had the same expectations that the other disciples did, that that huge crowd that was standing behind them did, and that everyone in Israel who was Jewish had. 
Their expectation was that when the Savior of the world would come, he would not suffer and die, but he would be a conquering general. He would be the one who would throw out the oppressors of the Israel, Israelites, which at that time happened to be the Romans. He would get rid of them, and God's people would finally be able to breathe the air freely. They would be able to live freely with their own people governing them. They would be able to worship God freely, without hindrance. They wouldn't be taxed by an outside government. They would be free to take care of themselves. That was the expectation that Peter and everyone in Israel for hundreds of years had had. They thought Jesus would restore Israel to the glory that it had in the days of the great King David. So Peter rebuked Jesus. But Peter's rebuke of Jesus showed just how deep-seated those false expectations were that people had of Jesus. So, again, Jesus rebukes Peter in the strongest terms because if Jesus was to fulfill the expectations of Israel and bring them glory here and now, that would mean that God's people might have some enjoyment as they lived in this life, but the price would be very high because if Jesus chose to bring glory now instead of suffering and dying for the forgiveness of sins, that would mean that they and we would remain in our sin. We'd lose our forgiveness and our salvation for the long term. And that wasn't why Jesus came. That's why this passage is so appropriate for us to think about in the season of Lent because it reminds us in the strongest terms that Jesus' purpose for us was to come and stand in our place and take the punishment we deserve for our sins all the way to his death on the cross so that we might be forgiven. And isn't that a great message? We Christians, alive and well in the world today, love to hear that message that we are forgiven. But that's not the end of the story because then again, Jesus, as he did so often in his ministry, took the unexpected, namely his cross, and he extended it even further when he said the following words. And let's read these words together. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Jesus threw Peter and the disciples for a loop at that point. And he throws you and I a huge curveball too. When he tells all Christians, not just the twelve, but what Jesus did before he said those words was, he waved the rest of the crowd up so that they could hear these words from him. And I think the reason why he did that was because Jesus didn't want people to think that it's just the higher ups in the church that have to carry the cross. It's just the national leadership. It's just district leaders. It's just the pastors and the paid staff of the church that have to carry the cross and nobody else does. No, he called the crowd up so that he could tell everybody, all believers in Jesus, are to carry the cross just as Jesus does. So Jesus challenges us to see that chasing the easy way in life in the short term can actually cause you to lose that which is most important for the long haul. So how then do we apply this passage to our lives today? The truth that Jesus teaches us here is that when we are called to be God's children, our calling isn't a one-time shot in which we're given a ticket, given a pass that we stick in our wallet, and we pull it out later at the end of our lives when we really need it to get into heaven. And oh, by the way, in the meantime, we can just do whatever we want. No, instead, our calling by God is a calling 
to a way of life that begins in our baptism, that continues as we are confirmed, as the eighth graders we've heard of today have professed their faith, and that carries on for the rest of our life. That is why Jesus says that whoever would come after him must take up his or her own cross and follow him continually. So, because we are God's children, we analyze our lives. We think about who we are and what we're about. And we want to strive to make sure that whenever we're tempted to deviate from what we know in our heart of hearts is the right thing, that we don't go for the short-term benefit at the cost of losing the long-term gain of being forgiven children of God. So we have to ask ourselves the question, where is God in what I'm doing? How does what I'm thinking of doing next, how's that going to affect my standing with the Lord? Is what I'm thinking of doing really worth it? And then after answering those questions honestly, we certainly want to take the way of the Lord because that's the way that's truly best. And what are God's expectations of us? His expectations of us are really relatively simple. He simply wants us to know, hey, I'm the son of the living God who suffered and died for your sins and who gives you new and eternal life. All I want of you is that you believe in me. And also, the Lord wants us to stand up for him and confess that we are his people. Not be ashamed of the gospel, but let people know, yes, I believe in God and I'm proud of the fact that he has made me his child. And we're thankful that the four eighth graders tonight have already done that in our service. And we want to make sure that in all we think, do, and say, our lives communicate to other people that Jesus is the Son of the living God and our Savior. And oh, by the way, he's your Savior too. So as we move on in Lent, we concentrate on the ultimate point for us. And that is that as we strive to constantly be faithful, there will be times when we struggle and fail. While it's important for us to honor the Lord in our lives, in the end, the question is not whether we have taken the easy way or the hard way, but that we know that Jesus once for all time has taken the right way for us. And it isn't our efforts to take up the cross that save us. Our taking up the cross is our thank you to God for what he's done for us. It's not our efforts to be perfect that save us, but it is what Jesus has done through his perfect obedience to the will of the Father that has saved us already. We remember and we remember without ceasing that the forgiveness Jesus earned for us because he was faithful even to death on the cross is always there for us. So this is our true expectation. Namely, that Jesus, as the Son of the living God, was totally dedicated to carry out the will of his Father for our eternal benefit. And as we live day by day, we are on that same path of walking with the Lord our God, remembering that we have joy in knowing that for Jesus' sake, we are now and forever children of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.